Welcome to this morning's American Security Project webinar. This is an on-the-record conversation that will be available for attribution. A recording of this conversation will be posted on our website. All audience members will be muted during the discussion, but please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions to the panelists. With that, I will turn it over to ASP CEO, Patrick Costello. Thank you. Good morning from Washington. Welcome. Uh, this week, NATO leaders met in Madrid, Spain for what was arguably the most important NATO summit in a generation. For years, the alliance had been seen as increasingly irrelevant, but the war in Ukraine has energized the alliance and given it a renewed sense of purpose. There were a number of noteworthy developments in Madrid, as well as alliance firsts, not the least of which was the release of a new strategic concept, NATO's last published strategic concept, basically a mission statement for the alliance in 2010. At that time, Europe was at peace and there was hope of a strategic partnership with Russia. And in the intervening dozen years, the world has changed and so have the chain challenges facing NATO. By many counts though, this was a solid, successful and historic summit, but now begins some of the hard work to follow. Joining us this morning is Admiral James Stravitas. He led the NATO Alliance in global operations from 2009 to 2013 as the 16th Supreme Allied Commander. In addition to his truly distinguished military career, Admiral Stravitas is one of our most prolific commentators on global security issues and is one of our most respected foreign policy and national security thought leaders. His latest work is the book, to Risk It All, Nine Conflicts and the Crucible of Decision, in which he offers up nine of the most useful and enthralling stories from the U.S. Navy's nearly 250-year history and draws on from them sets of insights that can be uh, useful and, and applicable to contemporary geopolitical challenges. Uh, Admiral Stravitas, thank you so much for joining us. Let's, let's get right into it. So there were a lot of headlines coming out of Madrid, but looking back a bit further, uh, you had a hand in drafting the last strategic concept. Uh, you worked with former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright in 2010 and created the document that was entitled Active Engagement, Modern Defense. And when you look back at the 2010 document, it largely reflected the times. Priority was given to the mission in Afghanistan, counterterrorism, the Balkans. China was not mentioned, but perhaps the most notable departure between where we are now and where we were in 2010 was that the 2010 document called for a, quote, true strategic partnership between NATO and Russia. And I think February 24th changed all that. Russia's invasion of Ukraine shocked our collective consciousness, but also served as a wake-up call. So if you could just give us your top-line assessment of how the alliance is dealing with a renewed Russian threat, and as well as some of the substantial changes agreed to at the NATO summit with respect to military posture bolstering up the East. Well, let's start with uh, thinking of NATO as a, uh, as a computer program. If NATO 1.0 was Cold War NATO, um, US and NATO against uh, Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact, um, we won that contest. Um, NATO 2.0, I think, was the period of time in which I was Supreme Allied Commander. Um, we were more seized with out-of-area missions, all that driven, of course, by the events of 9-11. Um, this was a period of time in which NATO was in Afghanistan, the Balkans, uh, over Libya, counter-piracy. was a very operationally expansive NATO, but one in which NATO did not face a, a significant peer competitor. That was NATO 2.0. And that really is the NATO of the previous strategic concept from 2010. Um, and in that period, yes, we looked um, at Russia as a potential partner, believe it or not, given the current circumstances. And um, I'll give you a very practical illustration of that. When I took command of NATO in 2009, um, there was a Russian military delegation uh, attached to my military staff in the Pentagon of NATO, if you will, in, uh, in Mons, Belgium. It, it would be like the Russians having a, a pretty substantial office set up in the Pentagon. So we were legitimately trying to pursue uh, zones of cooperation with the Russian Federation, and we achieved some. We worked with them on counter piracy. We worked with them on counterterrorism. They were 
somewhat helpful in Afghanistan. We acted together and thought about Arctic operations together. So it was a real thing. But unfortunately, um, we now come to Russia breaking it by invading Ukraine for the first time in 2014. That's what shattered NATO 2.0. And I think really created NATO 3.0. What has increased the throw weight uh, in such dramatic terms, and you're right, Patrick, to call this a generational shift, are the events, of course, of the last four or five months. Um, now we are in a significant new NATO, NATO 3.0. European defense budgets are rocketing up. Sweden and Finland have joined NATO, unthinkable during NATO 2.0 or even during NATO 1.0. And um, above all, we see the alliance hanging together so remarkably well in the face of this third invasion, the first being Georgia, second being Ukraine, the third, and the third being the second invasion of Ukraine. So we are very much in NATO 3.0, new strategy on the table, defense budgets going up, Sweden and Finland joining. I think it is an unfortunate necessity of the world that we have to confront Russia in such a dramatic way. We have a lot to unpack with elements within the new strategic concept, uh, but I do want to get your views on the Russian reaction. Now, senior officials in the Russian government had said that the NATO summit confirms NATO's policy of quote unquote, aggressive containment of Russia. And I'm wondering if you see, is Putin likely to see this strengthening as a major threat? I think it's important to note that Putin has been making similar statements going all the way back to the Munich Security Conference in 2007, uh, where he saw NATO in the West as a threat to Russia. But is this time different? And how do you think he will respond? Uh, Putin has no option to respond. He leads a weak nation with a defense budget of 60 or $70 billion a year. The NATO defense budget is north of $900 billion. So $60 billion versus $900 billion. He has an army that he has broken apart, fighting with, I don't know, the 15th largest army in the world in Ukraine. Um, he has no military capacity to challenge NATO in any realistic sense. Um, NATO has 3 million troops under arms, uh, active duty, another 4 million reserves. Russia has perhaps 400,000 capable military. They could, I suppose, draft a few more. Um, at the end of the day, um, and I'll give you one more, 24,000 military aircraft in NATO, maybe 5,000 in Russia. You get the point. Um, Putin does not have um, military options here in any significant way. And it's a common misconception among um, many Americans that, oh, Russia is somehow equal with the United States or equal with NATO, absolutely not. So Putin has no real options, particularly since he has cracked his military so significantly in this misbegotten war in Ukraine. Um, will he see it as a threat? I don't know, in some dark, twisted corner of his mind, he might. Um, for those who wanna weigh whether or not it is an actual threat, and sometimes I hear this from normally sensible people, this line that, oh, this is all the fault of NATO because NATO has expanded to the east. That's what caused Russia to invade. That's turning the world upside down. Open the book of history. I'll show you countless times Russian tanks have rolled west in the Second World War, raping their way across Germany, attacking uh, Budapest in 1956, destroying the Prague Spring in 1968, uh, approaching Warsaw when the Poles started to act independent. Russian tanks have rolled west many, many times in conquest. Never has a NATO tank rolled to the east. This is a defensive alliance, and I'll close with this, Patrick. I have read and participated in the writing of every single NATO war plan, every single one of them. And I can assure you there are no offensive war plans. NATO is a defensive alliance and the events of the last week, really the events in the last four months have strengthened our defense and our deterrence against Russia.
Thank you, sir. I do want to talk a bit about um, Finland and Sweden, which might be the most significant thing to come out of it because it is NATO enlargement. So I'm wondering what you think are the benefits and drawbacks of them joining joining the alliance. At a minimum, we'd add a very lengthy land border over a thousand kilometers uh, between NATO and Russia, creating a new frontier in its clash with the West. But um, what does adding Finland and Sweden also mean for NATO's deterrent? powers in Northern Europe, particularly around the Baltic Sea. I think this also highlights the importance of the high North and the Arctic. And then finally, on this Finland Sweden question, it can take up to a year for them to formally become members because they need the approvals of the national legislatures of the 30 existing NATO members. So is there any risk there? Is there a threat of Russian reprisal that we should be keep a weather eye on? Um, to the last question first, um, I think this is going to happen in, in the fall because of Russian uh, invasion, because of Russian threats, the more Russia threatens, the more they conduct combat operations, the faster this will happen. So no, I don't think there's much risk at all. And um, the objections the Turks had, I think have been assuaged. I think we're on a glide path to bring these two nations in this fall. Um, they are nothing but plus for, for NATO. Think of them as this. These are turnkey militaries. We don't have to go there and train them. We don't have to improve them. We don't have to inspect them. We don't have to worry about corruption. These are two remarkably professional militaries. And I don't say this because I watched CNN this morning. I say this because I commanded these troops in Afghanistan, in the Balkans, in Libya. My security detail in the Balkans was often provided by the Swedish military. And believe me, I've never felt safer in my life than surrounded by a bunch of six foot four inch Vikings. They all look like Chris Hemsworth. So these are highly capable on the surface with their troops and then dig a little deeper. These are two nations that are techno democracies, very adept at cyber, high level of ability to produce high end military. One example would be Sweden's Gripen fighters. These are the equivalent in every sense of the US F and A-18. Um, the Finns have one of the most professional ground forces. The Finns have more artillery pieces than any other nation in Western Europe. So again, turnkey operation. And let's close on this point because some say, oh, well, you know, we're adding, you know, 600 miles, 700 miles of border that we got to defend. I look at it the other way around. This is a border that Vladimir Putin has got to put troops against um, if he's going to be sincere about you know, facing NATO. So he's going to have to move troops all along this 600 mile border. And guess what? Those are troops not available to continue with his tragic misadventure in Ukraine. And second point, militarily, that border would flank any Russian attack on Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. It complicates his military planning immensely. Whereas because we're defensive, um, it is a, a matter of much less difficulty to array the defensive means we need there. All in all, um, there is zero downside and nothing but upside in bringing the Swedes and the Finns into the alliance. Great, thank you. You, uh, you mentioned Turkey. Um, Turkey has at times been, uh, been a bit of a headache, but <laughs> recent political, to put it lightly, recent geopolitical events have shown that it's, um, it's a headache that the alliance will have to, have to tolerate. Uh, you see Turkey leveraging its position within NATO. They pressured Sweden and Finland to change their stances on Kurdish support and arms embargoes, the Biden administration through its support behind a potential sale of F-16 jets to Turkey, which will likely face some opposition up in Congress. Nevertheless, the administration supports it. And some experts say that Turkey is today more valuable than ever to NATO. So I'm wondering, given all of these developments, what have we learned about Ankara's future relations with its allies, with the alliance more broadly, but also the importance of Turkey itself within uh, as a strategic element within the alliance? Um, let me begin with my time as uh, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. Um, every time we went to Turkey and said, we need troops or aircraft or ships, 
for Afghanistan, the Balkans, uh, for the war in Libya. Every single time Turkey delivered, every time. I cannot say that about any number of other nations who said, we just aren't going to put any more troops in Afghanistan, or we're not going to participate in operations over Libya, for example. The Turks were there 100% providing what the alliance asked them for. Number two, very professional military. It has gone through some difficult periods after the coup attempt uh, against President Erdogan and the repercussions of that knocked out a generation of Turkish senior leadership. I think the Turkish military has built back from that time uh, significantly. Number three, geopolitically, Turkey is vital. Uh, sometimes people say they're a bridge between the East and West. I, I suppose that's true. They're really a power center unto themselves. They have a rapidly expanding population, the second largest army in the alliance, um, strategically vital position, physically, geographically. Um, for all those reasons, it is crucial that the alliance maintain its relationship with Turkey. And to do that, um, as is the case between friends and allies, there can be disagreements. We have a significant disagreement with Turkey over their purchase of the S-400 air defense system from Russia. Um, Turkey has paid a price for that. They've been uh, pushed out from the Joint Strike Fighter program, which of course is why they now want the F-16s. I strongly support providing them what they need in F-16s. I also support them being pushed out of the Joint Strike Fighter program because of their purchase. So point being, there will be back and forth between Turkey and the United States and Turkey and the Alliance. And this most recent conversation about support to the Kurds is something I look at as between Turkey, Sweden, and Finland. And that's how it was resolved with some personal diplomacy, by the way, from our president, which I commend. But at the end of the day, President Erdogan had to be comfortable. The Swedes and the Finns had to be comfortable. Apparently that was concluded um, in a kind of deus ex machina, actually at the summit. Uh, but again, that's nothing but the strength of the alliance deployed in front of you. So I'll close by saying, we're gonna continue to have disagreements with Turkey and we may have disagreements with other members of NATO, we the entire alliance. But at the end of the day, I think the alliance is very strong in this moment of NATO 3.0. Now, within, within NATO, there have been some divisions about whether the alliance is part of the bedrock of the current international order and thus as a global role, or whether it has a more regionally focused security organization. The question appears to have been largely resolved in favor of global reach as the leaders agreed to categorize China as a principal challenge. I think it's important to also note that there are several uh, leaders from the Indo-Pacific Indo nations in Madrid. So I just would love your thoughts on the significance of directly mentioning China as a challenge to our security, as well as the significance of the presence of leaders from South Korea, Australia, New Zealand at the summit. And I, I also, I think that this move will sharpen perceptions uh, that a new Cold War style conflict is accelerating between the world's democracies led by the United States and European powers and the world's autocracies lining up behind China. So just kind of this broader frame as well. Would love your thoughts. Um, important to differentiate between the way the strategic concept looks at and talks about Russia and uses words like, like a threat, uh, clear and present danger, if you will. And the way the strategic concept talks about China which is more in line with a strategic competitor, a kind of a, a warning, a watch out, et cetera. So I think it's very important that we not lump those two together because frankly, if we do that, we're only gonna push those two more together. We ought to be seeking to try and find some division between Russia and China. Um, in terms of NATO, um, I think it's, it's a bit of both. It's a regional security, uh, structure that has now been in place since 1949. It started out looking at the Soviet Union as a grave threat. Today, it looks at Russia as a grave threat. 
We've been through NATO 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0, but a part of NATO 3.0 is that in addition to that regional immediate in your zone concern, you have to look more broadly. Three examples would be, and you mentioned one of them, Patrick, the Arctic, the high north. As the ice melts up there following the tragedy of global warming, what it will do is uncover hydrocarbons leading to competition. It will lead to claims by Russia of con control of those hy hy hypercarbon, <laughs> hypercarbon, hydrocarbons. And then thirdly, it's going to uh, open shipping routes that are going to be strategically of competition. So the Arctic is one area where look for NATO to operate. Number two, you can't touch and feel, but it's cyber. That's going to be a global effort by the Alliance, and we are going to welcome our additional partners in that. And then third and finally, it's the Pacific. Here, I think the biggest concern is China's territorial claims in the South China Sea. Um, if, if allowed to stand, if China were allowed to take the South China Sea, which is half the size of the continental United States, this would be the biggest territorial land grab maybe in history. And allowing that to stand would really crack the international order, particularly the, the doctrine of the high seas, freedom of the high seas, freedom of navigation, United Nations Law of the Sea Convention. All that would go up in smoke if China is allowed to simply control as territorial seas the South China Sea. So I think you will see NATO conducting, for example, freedom of navigation patrols. We've already seen the Brits, the French, the Germans are signed up to do it. I think it's a, a very short step to seeing a NATO mission, hasn't happened yet, but a NATO mission in the South China Sea. So the short answer to your question is NATO regional or global is, it's gotta be both in today's world. NATO 3.0 is both regional and global in scope. Um, the strategic concept identified climate change as the defining challenge of our time. This marks quite a change from the last time NATO updated its guiding principles. So can you tell us about how NATO is framing climate change and the and which, as the report says, it threatens every it threatens operations in every domain? It really does. And let, let's begin with the oceans. Um, if, if current conditions are allowed to continue the deterioration of the world's oceans through the dumping of plastics, the depletion of fisheries, um, and above all, the potential to diminish the ability of the oceans to conduct the photosynthesis that provides us 60, 70 percent of the air we breathe would be catastrophic for the human race. You know, Al Gore is fond of saying, many are, that the Amazon are the lungs of the earth. They do their part. The lungs of the earth principally are the oceans. So point one is ocean health. Point two, rising sea levels, which will swamp many low-lying islands, many uh, coastal cities, huge coastal cities. Bangkok, Saigon City are facing high tide situations that could have significant portions of them underwater by early to mid part of this century. Um, third point, the climate change that creates drought and creates uh, agricultural failures will create instability and unrest. We are already seeing that with the Russian shutoff of grain. Uh, that's going to create unrest in the North African and the Middle East take Russia out of the equation and park global warming and drought and crop failure, and you see that same level of unrest potentially happening. And by the way, as a Navy officer, I look at the largest naval base in the world, Norfolk, Virginia, is threatened by these rising sea levels. And then finally, Patrick, I'll, I'll simply point again to the high north, the Arctic, the way that could become a geopolitical thunderdome with Russia on one side of it, and at the moment, five, and with the addition of Sweden and Finland, seven NATO nations all up there on that Arctic front porch. So bottom line, uh, climate is woven through national security, and it's going to continue to be as the century unfolds. NATO has to do its part to maintain security 
but also to help address these climatological challenges. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, we've got a limited amount of time left, um, so I'll pose this last <laughs> final question to you. Admiral, in your new book, you profile naval leaders acting in extreme crisis, and one of the challenges identified in the strategic concept is in the maritime domain and Russia's ability to disrupt allied reinforcements and freedom of navigation across the North Atlantic, identifying it as a strategic challenge. So as a student of history, as a student of leadership, I was struck by one line in your book in particular, that the sea can serve as a laboratory that can inform critical decision-making ashore. So can you tell us if there are any lessons from history that uh, we can turn to or characters that you profile in your book, uh, To Risk It All, Nine Conflicts and the Crucible of Decision, uh, that might be instructive or insightful as we do look at NATO 3.0 and this challenging new operational environment? Yeah, I think uh, the best place to go to think about the history that's going to unfold in front of us is back to uh, just over 100 years ago, geopolitical writer Halford Mackinder, who talked about the importance of controlling the length, what he called the world island, the Europe and Asia, that massive land area. And in order to, to have balance between land and sea powers, which is a trope that goes back to the ancient Greeks, Athens and Sparta, uh, goes back to Nelson and the British Royal Navy against the continental armies of Napoleon. I think we're, we're about to see in NATO 3.0, the reemergence of the world's sea powers operating and challenged by those who dominate the world island, and that would be Russia and China. So this is a, a chapter from history we've seen before. It's probably time to dust off our Alfred Thayer Mahan theories of how sea power has to be part of creating this challenge to the land powers and see if we can prove Mackinder wrong and Alfred Thayer Mahan correct. Admiral Servetus, thank you so much for joining us. I thought we had a fantastic and wide ranging conversation. I appreciate your support of the American Security Project and your membership in our Consensus for American Security Network. Uh, that is all the time we have uh, to our guests on the line. Thank you for joining. And I hope everyone has a healthy and safe 4th of July. Well said. Thank you, Patrick. Happy 4th.